good, wise, and, on occasion, decent people of Alan's army. Today I'm unrolling something new. You'll notice I'm croaky this week, and can decide by the end whether it ends up being worthwhile. Let's just say that this voiceover wasn't achieved in a single take. And yes, I know, I was supposed to, finally, drill the hole in Alan's shell and glass in the reflex heater flu cow this week, but the wet and windy weather persisted. It cleared as my final evening drew in, when naturally it became too cold to use resins. We'll persevere, I promise. But I've got on with other, bitty tasks in the meantime. To begin, this stuff, which is basically very expensive Velcro, but apparently it's worth the more than £10 that a mere metre of paired jewel lock costs. I've been looking for stronger, more durable and less messy alternatives to traditional hook and loop strips and came across this. The core product comes in three densities of mini mushrooms, 170, 250 and 400, which combine to give you different levels of grab strength. It's usually backed with foam and an acrylic 3M adhesive that strengthens over the days after bonding. Dual lock appears to be made of polypropylene, which probably writes the strips off for cold arctic work, but I found applications inside Alan for it and these are just the start. Firstly, fixing my wall clock and joint barometer and hygrometer to the wall, but so I can remove them to calibrate and change batteries. Also for this junction box where I had to mount it back to front, and so the screw fixing is no longer accessible. It's purely testing for now, but you get the gist. Let's zoom Boward to where the last episode left off. In our new recess for the diesel heater, I've placed the sheets of fiberglass in to give me a flat base, and then the first task is to glass them in both to stop any damage to the foam and also so that there's a watertight seal. I've decided to use woven fiberglass fabric here. It's a twill weave that can handle corners and angles and is around 200 DSM, so that's seven ounces I think to those who prefer for things not to be divisible by 10. I could have used chopped strand mat here as it's not a critical structure, but I don't have any spare offcuts and all I do have is the CSM designed for use with epoxy resin and because I'm feeling cheap, I'm using polyester resin for this job. I've done a number of composites episodes in a separate playlist on the channel, and I hope to have some time to do some more in future, in particular about S-glass versus quote-unquote normal glass, and also dispelling myths about often misunderstood carbon fibre. Anyhow, I could have gone crazy with shaping and fairing and sanding and so on to end up with this step perfectly uniform and smooth, but frankly I'm not sure the reflex heater has earned such commitment and toil from me just yet. Plus, I'm going to heat shield them so you wouldn't be able to notice. The edges will be edged, so don't get cross at me leaving those ragged, free and unashamedly anarchistic for now. I will though calm you all down by casually taking some snip pliers to my very, very important engine electrical loom. There's a yellow connector that's never had its opposite number clicked into place. This is because Alan came rather sparsely outfitted, unlike some I've seen online, and so without any temperature, pressure or RPM gauges. The red 8-way connector is in use, and it heads off yonder to the switch panel, but... I simply cannot get this connector apart. I think it's completely seized with corrosion, so I'm going to have to cut the wires and then redo them later on. Around the engine, there are two previously roll-wrapped sets of wires. One set on the starboard side runs to the alternator and starter motor, plus the cooling thermostat. On the port side, a pair run to the oil pressure gauge, and another black one to near the fuel pump. Talking of the existing loom and connections, I've long glanced at them with something of a side eye, wondering whether to leave them alone. The electrics have been reliable to date, all the connections are original, and so I didn't want to invent a job for myself. Regardless, it's not the prettiest zone on Alan's engine, the rest is clean with a patched up paint job. And the ready-made loom, unhelpfully, has all of the wires the same colour, which does complicate identifying one from another. I spent so long trying to prise apart the two halves of the red 8-way connector and yes I did check for little catches and yes I ended up with dents in my skin that in the end I gave up and resorted to snipping them on the loom side. I could only assume that corrosion had fused them together, albeit while still maintaining adequate connections. Not much current flows through wires like this. The white cable though had parted company from its terminal, vindicating my investigation. So began the task of, first of all, Noting which wires in fact have a beginning, indeed a middle, but as it turns out, no end. I.e., they are there to connect to gauges I don't possess. 
and most importantly, taping all the black wires I cut from the loom's end one by one, and then writing which coloured wires they corresponded to. Otherwise, the game of me trying to work out which is which would have had you all cackling from your seats. Comment section hero, jet ski guy, in particular would have contributed excellent scorn and derision, although he's been quiet of late. Handwriting aside, I have succeeded, and now I can retrieve all the cables through their current routing and into fresh air. There's no real point me keeping the electrics based at the rear of the engine, and clearing the area is convenient for access to the fuel lift lever, cooling impeller housing, and so on. I've also noticed the existing wires, and indeed spade terminals, not only look pretty tired, but are now rather stiff too. I'd wager it wouldn't take even a minor Allen tantrum for the strands inside to fail, or the sheaths to crack and expose the copper conductor. So I'm cleaning the contacts up, and I will do so on the oil pressure sensor too, and they await shiny new spades when my multicolored wires arrive in the post. Aside from that, all I've done until ready to rewire is to face the brilliant light, and continue Alan's irrepressible and indeed inevitable journey into the same. I'm organising and labelling the old wires. These two, for example, go nowhere at the moment, but I think one may successfully talk to the tachometer I have sitting in a box. I do also need to choose a new way to connect my new wires. The old plastic connectors are toast, of course, and they seem unnecessarily bulky and evidently are a pain to work with. So I'm making another one of these that I've come up with and employed in other parts of the electric spaghetti junction, I bonded little groups of inline Wago connectors into blocks. They are secure, easy to use and change over, and can be protected from knocks within little chock boxes. Here's an example of another such block used to mate together the wires for Allen's external lights, going from their fuse box to the switch box. Sit back and absorb the excitement. And imagine, I'll do an episode this century when I will finally mount the heater cowl into Allen's shell. That, together with rewiring the engine, must surely please the YouTube gods. Whilst gazing at Alan's engine, I noticed something. In just these few weeks since the exhaust went on, some surface rust has formed on the turbo's flange. This is probably because the two flanges are of dissimilar types of steel. That's fine. We'll coat the vulnerable areas of primer with a high temperature paint. I probably should have bought a tin of brush-on paint, rather than aerosol, but life goes on if a little speckled, and with a couple of metres less masking tape in my inventory. How smart, and it's even rust colour. Whose idea was that? Before I go, I'm going to share this with you. Did I mean to jump the whole way down? No, I missed the step and chose in the split second to leap so I could land safely. Anyhow, lesson learned with a sore foot. Back to the point, Alan's transom is due for transformation this winter. I'm substantially reinforcing the fiberglass so it can take emergency tiller and electric motor mounts. And I'm making a removable, railing-protected extension for people to stand on. I chose GRP anti-slip grating, as it is tough as hell, self-drains, works fine in the cold, and I can shape it and add hatches and so on. Hours before I was about to buy a large sheet, the inimitable friend of Alan, and indeed of mine, Dick, mentioned over an overdue catch-up dinner that he had a couple of spare sections. Extraordinarily, they are exactly the specification I was aiming for. So, thanks Dick, and that's something to look forward to in upcoming episodes, once I've finally installed that Allen heater chimney. Bye. <laughs>